much. So yeah, I'm really honoured to have been asked to do this and it's really a great privilege for me to actually reach back out to the um, Irish community. I'm currently living in the UK and I've lived away from Ireland for over four years. So it really is quite a privilege to be able to do this now. And we're very lucky at times like this that actually we are able to communicate online in such a way over things like Zoom and video calling. So it's absolutely brilliant and I'm really glad to have you all. So don't be afraid to ask any questions throughout. We'll try and get to as many as of them as we can at the end. And I must apologize in advance because I was hoping to do a live demo for you today, but as such is the reality with working from home, we had a bit of a glitch earlier and I accidentally locked my um, studio keys in the studio. So instead of showing you a live demo, I'm going to be pointing towards my uh, YouTube channel where you'll be able to see um, lots of different glass making demos there instead. So hopefully that will be um, still helpful and interesting for you. So big thanks to the Design Cross Council Ireland for asking me to do this. It's an absolute honor and we'll get started. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm obviously Laura Quinn and I'm a glass designer. I would have uh, previously called myself a glass artist, but in most recent years, I definitely consider myself more of a glass maker and a glass designer. This, um, what we're doing today, I'm going to go through a presentation of my journey of how I got to where I am now, including kind of my education and then some of the research, um, both theoretical and material research. Um, that brought me to finished pieces that have kind of gone on to be shown in different exhibitions um, and appeared in different galleries. So we'll get started. So I started off here in NCAD, which I'm sure a lot of you will recognise, but for those that don't, it's the National College of Art and Design and it's based in Thomas Street in Dublin. So um, I started there in 2011 uh, when it was a four year course. Um, I did a year of core year, which was kind of really building up kind of notebooking, journaling, sketchbooks, um, trying to really, I guess, flex our skills in idea generation. And we got a chance uh, during that year to do a week in two different subjects that we were considering taking on as our um, specialism for our degree. So I tried out sculpture and then I tried out glass. Um, I was very much 3D inclined rather than 2D, so those were the obvious choices. But as soon as I got into glass, I absolutely fell in love with it straight away. Um, we were just thrown straight into the deep end, straight into the hot shop, working with molten glass, and we had to come up with a finished piece just within five days, fully hot sculpted, fired, um, polish, polished and ground. So it was um, very full on, very intense, but that's what I absolutely loved about it from day one. So I had the, um, privilege to study under Dr. Caroline Madden, who is still there, the head of the glass department. And she herself is, has um, a very profound glass practice, um, but she also um, is highly regarded as well as an educator and has spent many years abroad and over in the States working and studying. So she brought a lot of good kind of, I guess, she brought a lot of good discipline in terms of my own education to me and a lot of lessons that I've kept with me to this date. So I have a lot to thank her for. This was the first ever glass piece that I made after my week induction. Um, it's a cast glass piece and it's actually made from crystal cast from um, Waterford Crystal, some of their um, off cuts. So it was an Eng Engineers Ireland um, trophy proposal that I made for a competition and it was based off of the copper um, coiling around engines. So in 2014, I had the honour to be selected to go on international exchange to Southern Illinois University. Um, so that was in Carbondale, down at the very, very bo bottom of Illinois. Um, and the difference between the campuses alone was absolutely stark. Uh, just getting over the sheer size of it, the amount of resources they had in different making, making materials and different workshops was unbelievable. So it was a really, really great experience for me. I studied there under uh, Ji Young Lee, who is very renowned for his uh, work within glass lamination. So he works a lot with actually clear glass that he cuts up um, and he grinds. Then he relaminates it with color, colored um, hextile glue that cures under heat lamps. And then he goes back and grinds and polishes them off to these very 
well well defined forms at the end so it was really great to learn under him for a while and this is my original workshop partner Jenny Mulligan so she came with me from NCAD over to America um, and we absolutely loved it there we had a ball but we worked very hard for we were sometimes doing 12 13 hour days in the workshop um, so we really definitely used it to the absolute max and she's over now in Sweden studying there she makes great work so do check her out so this is the work that I started on when I was there um, and I was looking at kind of female and male archetypes um, and how they were represented. And um, I was using a glass enameling technique that I learned from Cappy Thompson. Um, so it was a case of like painting on glass and firing it. Um, and then I started to kind of really consider what is the purpose of uh, vessels within glass rather than just making kind of vases for shelves what is the actual purpose of a vessel and um, this was around the time that kind of the campaigns for repeal was becoming very um, kind of uh, widespread in the media so it was a topic that kind of naturally cropped up in my work um, looking at kind of female archetypes uh, or traditional archetypes and how I could maybe consider consider a conversation within within a glass vessel using that. And um, the culmination then of that bo body of work and that project was um, this uh, neck piece. It's quite a dark photograph, but hopefully you can see it. Um, so this is made using the glass networking or knitting technique, which um, some of you might have heard of. It's done using lamp working, which is a small flame that you uh, melt glass rods on and you can manipulate them. Um, so this literally is built up almost like a kind of crochet style. Um, and it's two halves that open and come around the neck and it's meant to be reflective of the color that's found on some lizards, but also a kind of nod to the Victorian rough. So while I was there, I got to uh, go to a lot of different events and really start to connect outwards to the international audience. So I got to go to the Glass Art Society conference in Chicago, um, which was an absolutely amazing three days full of demonstrations from different makers from around the world. And you're talking about people who are absolutely leaders in their field, pioneering techniques. Um, and it was really great just to be part of an audience and um, ask questions to them, but also to be able to actually join them afterwards in the bar at the end and have a good old chit chat about um, what they do and if I could get involved in any way. So after that, then I went on to, I got a scholarship to study in the Corning Museum of Glass and I did a five day intensive workshop in lamp working, which is that technique I mentioned where, where you use a small flame. So I did this with an artist called Daphna Kaufman, who's an Israeli artist. And this was really, um, as you'll see further on in the slides, the start of the technique that I incorporated in my final body of work for my BA. So I left America then and came back in, um, in to do my final year in NCAD. And unfortunately, uh, the timing wasn't great. Um, it was a year of absolute turmoil in NCAD. Um, some of you might remember being in the news, there was lots of protests, um, kind of questions over the accounting that was happening there. And generally there was a lot of unrest amongst the student body. Um, now, fortunately for us, we have an absolutely amazing staffing in the glass department that couldn't support us any more than they did. They were so, so wonderful. But what it did mean is that we actually had a furnace failure. Our glass melting furnace broke that year and we weren't able to light it back up. So instead of me blowing glass for my final body of work, I had to completely change my direction and my making method, which was um, very stressful at the time, but um, as you'll see, led on to a very complete body of work. So I was trying to maybe get the same scale as I would have with glass blowing using different glass methods. And um, I found with lamp working, it was always very maybe small until you start to, I guess, create smaller parts and build them up into a bigger form. However, if you build up these parts into a bigger form, purely made out of glass, it, it can become very fragile. So I started looking at how they could maybe sit within an armature that was a different material. And here I actually have on the top there, they're all uh, individually made glass flowers on glass stalks and they slot into silicone pockets that I made within this um, riveted kind of plastic armature that sat on the head. 
Um, it was also a chance for me as well to really explore lamp working further now that I couldn't blow glass. So um, I started to really try and explore the techniques I'd learned in the class in Corning and to um, come away from maybe the derivative forms of uh, making just glass botanicals, but to make, make them with real purpose and meaning and a, a strong concept and trying to really look at the, I guess, the engineering of how I could build up these larger forms um, on, on the lamp, but using alter alternative materials with glass. So one of the big eureka moments for me was um, using glass tubing to melt my glass flowers onto and then um, stringing uh, copper coated steel through th that tubing and then welding the copper coated, copper coated steel into a bigger framework. So you can see here on the left, the, um, the steel there goes through the tubing and that's what holds the glass in place. So this in a way acted actually like a protective armature for the glass. And that's what the final piece looked like there, if you can see that. And this was based on the use of gorse in traditional Irish medicine for um, uh, kidney function. So as you can see, material testing was a huge theme for my final year. And I was looking at maybe combining ceramics and glass, but in the end I came away from this because of the fact that actually they're too similar in a way. They're both hard and um, not flexible. So what I really wanted to do instead was combine glass with a soft material. And that's when I eventually came on to using rubber. Um, and rubber is soft and flexible. It's opaque, glass is transparent. And it was that juxtaposition that has really kind of uh, fed its way through my practice ever since. But I've also included here a picture of a maquette I made for this piece um, and it's just to give you an idea if you're out there and you're used to working in a studio with a lot of equipment you can still do a lot with paper and an old hanger and figure out the forms you want to make so not all hope is lost at the moment you can still do a huge amount of work at home now in in your room so this is the piece that that finally came became and I didn't I didn't even make the glass in NCAD. I actually went and rented out a little studio over in the west coast of Ireland in Ackle to make the glass for that. So there's about 30 um, glass components in that. It's mixed with tire rubber um, and then there's hot sculpted glass there on the end, the red bit. So what was important about this piece is that each of those glass um, bell shapes had feet on the end of them that I wrapped rubber around so that if um, needed be, if any of them broke, I could literally unwrap the rubber and take them out and repair them and put them back in. So that was the real start of my journey, looking at interchangeable glass design mixed with alternative materials. That's what that piece looked like. And then this piece here, um, similarly to the gorse um, one, was welded within a steel cage and this was actually acquired by the Office of Public Works for their Irish State Art Collection. So as soon as I packed down my degree uh, from NCAD, my degree show, I flew off to America the next day to work at the Corning Museum of Glass and I got to teach there for a summer teaching um, just regular regular audiences who had never touched glass before how to work with hot glass. So it was absolutely amazing and it really taught me how to communicate my practice to people who had never touched the material before but were really keen to learn about it. And I met an incredible amount of people there coming from all backgrounds, all different practices and connections that, I, that I've kept to this day. And then um, three months later, I went on my Erasmus Plus internship over to Estonia in the middle of the forest, about two hours south of Tallinn. Um, it was a school that was based on an old German manor. Uh, this is the studio here and the large chimney comes out of the ceramics workshop. And across the other side of that pond was where I lived. So I got to look at the studio every day when I woke up in the morning. And this is where I lived. It was the old blacksmith's headquarters uh, on the German manor. So I learned a lot when I was there, um, mostly about production, but we had a lot of commissions to make for different ministries. This was for the Ministry of Agriculture. We also had a honey workshop on, on site. So we made these honey jars uh, using wood turn molds um, and then went and got them filled in the a honey studio on site, which was wonderful. And we got to uh, really, I guess, work with um, 
how what, what what was the idea of guess I guess like a trophy so these were actually given out as kind of trophies and favors um, at some of the ministry meetings um, so I really started to think about production within my own work at this stage and started looking towards lighting so this is um, blown glass into uh, would you believe it or not chicken wire um, but it was really starting to understand how can I use another material to make a finished product alongside glass. So then I came eventually to the UK to work for Local Glass, which is by Colin and Louise Hawkins. They're based in Gloucestershire. They're in the Cotswolds and they're absolute experts in their field at sand carving or sand blasting, as some of you might know it. Um, so it's a glass blowing workshop as well. But they also do a huge line of outdoor work um, and have really, I guess, problem solved the uh, way to have glass pieces outside in the frost and the heat and rain and storms um, and make them really durable. So I learned a lot from them and really got to see more about how to price your work and make work that actually would sell. I then went back to the Corn Museum of Glass to do another another workshop. This was another scholarship I got and I got to study under Martin Russell and Pavel Novak who are two Czech glass artists who um, specify in glass carving. So they really work with the optics of glass but they also use lamination techniques as well. So here are some shots. This is some work that I produced from it um, and this got me really I guess starting to love the optics of glass and trying to make pieces that purposefully brought out the optics of it. So after about two years working in the field, I thought it was kind of time for me to go back and re-approach my own practice. And the main reason for this was when I was working in, in local glass, we actually got a lot of people who brought in antique riding flasks to us where the glass was broken. Um, so we had to smash it out of the really fine ornate silver um, to remake a new one and repair repair it. Um, but what you often would find is that actually uh, it becomes very risky that you might damage the silver by trying to take the glass out. And that's because they were cemented together. So that's a traditional way that they were joined. However, for me, I kind of felt there must be a better way to join metal and glass or glass and other materials. So that when it does come to the fact that glass does break um, occasionally, that it can be taken out and it can be repaired and it doesn't mean that the whole object is defunct. So that was actually the main driver for me to go back and uh, look at my masters. So I went to Plymouth College of Art, which is down in Devon, way down on the south coast of England. It's an absolutely beautiful place, um, a very calm place. It's not huge either, which is good for me. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to really do my master's in somewhere like London. I think it would be too busy for me. I definitely needed a calmer city and to be beside the water. I'm from Mayo myself, so being beside water is actually very important for me. Um, and it was a very, I guess, appropriate place for me to be for two years of absolute manic making and stress in the hot shop. So my uh, main research question was, can we improve the interface between handmade glass and other materials with the assistance of digital design technologies to create a viable handmade object in the production setting? And it wasn't long until I came across David Pye's um, work on the nature and art of workmanship. So um, if for those of you who aren't familiar, David Pye uh, taught in the Royal College of Art. Um, he was a very highly acclaimed theorist, but he also had a very strong practice himself um, as a furniture maker. So what he kind of talks about in this is actually backed up by practice led research. And the way he um, broke down the workmanship of risk, which is using um, any kind of technique or apparatus in which the quality of the result is not predetermined, but depends on the judgment, dexterity and care which the maker exercises as he works. Um, really reflected on actually handicraft and the workmanship of certainty which would be associated with mass automated production would be um, the type where the quality of the result is exactly predetermined before a single saleable thing is made. Now he even goes on to talk about in that book that actually a lot of practices blur the lines between the two even if you look like at a potter who uses a jig to make their work that introduces some amount of certainty. And for me, it was actually the riskiness of glass blowing that 
um, I guess didn't sit well with me for its sustainability. The fact that you could go into the hot shop and at the end of the day, you could have blown glass for hours and used up so much gas, but not have actually made anything that um, was functional or sellable at the end to me seemed like a massive waste and very unsustainable. So I started to look at how can I turn to mass automated production and uh, consider some of those modes within the workmanship of risk um, of handmade glass and meet somewhere in the middle. So for me, I really think as neo artisans, even all of us listening here, we really have um, the skill set to be able to take from the workmanship of certainty, work, looking at machines and factory processes and the workmanship of risk, looking at real handicraft and meeting somewhere in the middle that we can really produce very strong, sustainable work that has the unique character of risk, but has the sustainability of certainty. So if I were to ask you, what are the applications of 3D printing within glass blowing? I'm sure some of you might think of this. The uh, 3D printed clear, optically clear glass um, printer, which was pioneered by the MIT Media Lab. And it's absolutely stunning. However, I do often wonder, um, is it really accessible to us as makers over here on this, on this side of the ocean? Um, and it's not really a tool that's in every maker's um, toolbox. So how could I maybe look at um, 3D printing in glass and take, I guess, the principles of it, but work in a more accessible way? So that brings me back to looking at what, the, what does the word sustainable mean? And of course, it's a practice that has a low ecological impact, but it's also a practice that can be altered easily to suit the maker and the client or the manufacturing environment. And that includes if you have to travel about and open studios and close studios, or you're living out of a suitcase and traveling around the world and working in different places, that you have um, a manufacturing design methodology that is sustainable over your, over your time and career. So it's kind of no good for me to create a completely environmentally friendly practice if I can't sustain it for life. So I really started to turn to um, methodologies from product design um, rather than actually a theory from craft design to start to look at the ecological impact of what I was making and how I could change that. And I picked out three areas of the whole object life cycle in which I wanted to intercept and make more sustainable. So looking even at the production, what materials am I using? What process am I using? Can I use a process that lowers the amount of time I'm burning up gas? And um, can I also, during the production stage, really use um, human resources and human expertise um, and collaborate with other people who were able to help me and make the process more efficient and more sustainable rather than, I guess, holding on to the authorship of every single part of it? Then looking at use to make my, my pieces more durable and to make them bespoke to the person as well. And at the end of life and the reuse, looking at the materials that were used, could they be detangled? Because a lot of the problem now with recycling is that actually a lot of the materials we try to recycle every day are too entangled. Um, so the materials I use, can they all come apart and be recycled in their, in their own kind of classification? And also actually, could the piece be repaired? Could it be brought back to me? Could I repair it and send it back out to them? So that actually, it doesn't come to end of life, it comes to reuse. So we look at now at the production. And I want to kind of talk a little bit about the idea of materialism and how actually um, materi materialism isn't just focusing on like flashy cars. It's actually about loving a material and loving a material object. And the fact that actually we can redefine what materialism means and really builds up that narrative with our audience from the very beginning using digital platforms like YouTube, like Facebook and Instagram, building up the narrative from the very, very beginning with the end user um, to love that object before it's even made or during the making process. So um, I started off by 3D printing um, some forms that I wanted to make in glass. So this was actually a specific commission from a client of mine for his sister's wedding. And he asked for a set of whiskey tumblers. He showed me kind of an idea he had in mind, but I was like, leave it with me, I'll redesign it. So um, I ended up with this design, which is a square on the bottom that twists up to a circle on the top. This I then 3D printed and was able to show him uh, and see what he thought of it. So you're kind of managing the client's expectations from the very beginning. So it means you have a higher chance of 
uh, or higher likelihood of success once you get into the hot shop and you're burning gas it's like well at least we kind of know the client has an idea of what it's going to look like at the end so less likely to reject it completely but not only are those 3D prints prototypes, they're also directly what we can take the mold from that we blow the glass into. And they can come with me all over the world. They're light. I can just throw them into um, a bag and remake the plaster molds wherever I go. So these plaster molds here, there's probably a good few of you listening today who have worked with plaster before. These are for blowing. They're not for going in a kiln however they're mixed with sawdust and toilet paper pulp would you believe um that's the recipe i learned when i was in estonia and the sawdust and the toilet paper pulp act as not only grog to strengthen the mold but um they keep the mold damp when you're blowing into it so it doesn't crack so these molds last up to 40 units which is actually quite a good figure for plaster blow molds and it makes small batch production become very efficient and if I were to say tweak the design and reprint it it doesn't cost me uh, you know a few hundred pounds to uh, remake a mold instead it costs me more like nine pounds so it becomes very um, sustainable for my own practice as well and here is the finished result so they're called the vortex whiskey tumblers and that's now um, a product that I make and sell um, all the time. So it's very much um, been a successful, successful research project. So I was meant to show you a video today of the making of them, but unfortunately, um, with Zoom and screen sharing, it becomes a bit staggered and you can't really see the um, video very well. So I've got a few um, screenshots here for you taken from the video. And at some point, um, I think the De Design and Crafts Council Ireland will hopefully be sharing on one of their online platforms the full video of the making for it. So do check that out when that goes online. Yeah, Laura, so, just to jump in there, sorry, is um, we're actually getting some lovely comments about how people are really enjoying the presentation. So um, they're all asking if it's possible to, one, one uh, person, Ashling, is saying that she'd love to share it with her art students. So we must yeah. see if we can try and get the presentation and the video somewhere that we can share it with everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm more than happy to. I, I work in education myself now, so I'm so happy, like, for, for people to just spread the word about glass making. So absolutely share ahead and we'll, we'll try and get the presentation together with the video and everything so you'll be able to catch up on it. Lovely stuff. So here's some stills anyways to get an idea of it for now. So uh, the previous shot there um, was, that's the uh, in Plymouth, Plymouth where I did my master's, the workshop, um, beautiful space, nice big furnace we were working from. Um, so if for those of you who don't really know how glass blowing works, you're essentially blowing through a hollow uh, steel iron, which I have in my hand there. And um, that's a shot looking into the furnace and that's the molten glass being gathered up on the end. And um, I'm not even kidding here. When I started off glass blowing, I was told to go home and practice picking honey up on a chopstick because that's what it's like uh, picking molten glass up on a blowing iron. And that's just shaping it there. So um, because these are the whiskey tumblers, we want a nice chunky bottom on them. So it's really pushing that glass down with a, a wet wooden paddle, bringing it down to the bottom. And that's it just going into the mold. Uh, you can see the mold there is a two part mold. You, you have several different types of molds. You can have one part, two part, three part more. Um, I like to stick to two, keep it nice and simple. Um, so it goes into the mold, then it inflates and it picks up the shape from inside the mold. So whatever you took your mold off, that's essentially what you get at the end. Um, that's it. Uh, I just have a tool on there to chill, it, chill the hot glass so that it kind of creates stress between where it's attached to the iron and the actual piece. And then I just tap it and it comes straight off and then it goes in the kiln and it stays there overnight. It goes through a firing schedule um, called annealing and that takes out all the stress that's in the glass. And then the next morning it's at room temperature and it's ready to be taken out. And what I do is I cut off the top, grind it down, bevel it off and then bring it up to a high polish. So um, when I was talking about kind of managing clients' expectations and the advantage of being able to 3D print prototypes, even being able to draw up the drawings that are going to be 3D printed, these drawings can be taken and using different rendering programs, this I use Keyshot to make, is a rendered image that kind of semi-realistically shows what that uh, decanter that I 3D printed would look like in glass. And that's what it did look like in glass after I made it. So you can tell it's not actually too far from, from the 
finished result. So again, that's just managing client's expectation. At that point, they can say, can we tweak some things here and there? But of course, there's always a place for the unknown and the little kind of lumps and bumps you get from authentically handmade design as well, which makes every piece unique. And you can't always kind of uh, replicate that in 3D printing. So there's always a place for the handmade. So looking at use as well, um, I wanted to combine my lamp working process, which I told you about earlier on the torch um with uh, alternative materials and looking at the flexibility in alternative materials so again this was meant to be a video so my apologies that um we're not able to share it with you right now but here are some stills from it this is lamp worked glass mixed with 3d printed flexible pla um and what it allowed was it meant it, the structure was actually really really flexible and movable you can see it just it, it twists almost like a double helix and by combining uh, these traditionally handmade glass objects with um, materials that were made using new digital design technologies, whether it's 3D printing, laser cutting, or water jet cutting, it meant I could actually um, enable a closer user, mater user material experience. And that just builds up the emotional durability of the object. So this is... Um, one of my pieces from my final body of work for my masters that is the lamp worked glass mixed with um that was laser cut rubber for that one and same again for that and then this piece here i was uh, meant to be wearing one today but that got locked in the garage along with everything else uh, when i locked my keys in there earlier so um i'm gonna have to just explain it to you instead this is a neck piece it's the white parts are blown glass there are two individually blown glass pieces that I've cut um, and brought up to a polish and at the back there is a 3D printed ball and socket joint so just like in your shoulder or in your hip that's exactly what it's based on. So this ball and socket joint was designed on Rhino or Rhinoceros and um, some of you might know that as a CAD program and what was great about this is that actually I was able to um, design the angle at which the um, glass could move. So it could open up to come over the head and fit the wearer no matter what their contours are, whether they're flat chested, large chested, if they have more curved neck, it, it actually um, kind of sat and nestled into place really nicely. However, the designed angle of rotation didn't allow the glass to not hit off each other, so it protected it from itself. And that's mixed there with um, some recycled inner tubes from bicycles. So that's the great thing about 3D printing is that you can actually print things within things um, like that ball and socket joint shows. Um, and the other advantage as well um, to be able to actually make a fitting to fit around an already blown piece of glass is that actually I could design the holes to fit the diameter of the glass specifically. And that's something I'll touch on um, a few slides later on in the presentation. So that's the final piece there. So the work that I've just shown you uh, appeared this year in craft, the Craft Council in here in Britain in Collect in Somerset House in London. That was, I think, in April. So now we'll get on to the third and final stage that I tried to intercept during this body of work, and that's reuse and end of life. As we know, glass breaks. That there's no denying that. But um, I really uh, tried to kind of strengthen my own practice all along with theoretical research. So going back to uh, the reading by Potts and Sims, who also talked about new materialism that I mentioned earlier on, they look at being able to extend the life of the object. The owner would know how to polish, adjust, oil and repair it. So you think about any shirts that you might have at home where buttons fall off. You don't throw out the shirt, you repair the button. Um, you know, you darn things that are ripped. So it's definitely something I wanted to actually include in my glass practice that actually if one piece of glass broke in an overall object, uh, I don't want the whole object to become defunct. I just want that little one piece to be taken out and by the actual owner, not by me, that they'd, they'd have some ownership over this piece and some um, confidence to go about it, be able to take it out, send it to me in a small jiffy bag in the post, you know, even looking at how could I reduce uh, transportation um, energy by by instead of them shipping the whole piece in a big box or big crate actually just shipping a little jiffy bag to me and then i would repair that piece of glass and send it back to them 
but what it, what it also enables um, is that over time, if they want to say that arm piece that you saw, if they were going to an event, they were wearing say a blue outfit, if they said, well, actually I want blue glass and instead of clear, they could start to co-design and co-author the piece um, over time. And then that allows it to become almost like an antique chain or an antique piece of metal jewelry that it can be um, heirloomed and made to fit the wearer, um, you know, down through the generations. So whenever I'm going through my practice, it isn't a case of I go through the design stage and then I make a piece and then that's it. It's a constant back and forth. Um, and that can really be seen, I guess, in the way that I communicate on my social media channels. I always try to include you in the whole part of the process and be very honest about it when it works and when it doesn't work. So it's really important for me to look at work that was successful and think, right, what do, what, what do I want to take from that and look at the parts that maybe I'd like to redesign. So even looking at how uh, this glass could be used in a way as studying um, in sustainable fashion could um, uh, kind of patterns for different pieces of couture clothing be made up and instead of being sewn together they could be held together by these glass studs that pop through a hole that's in each of them and that's what holds it in place it's and it's something that can be just taken out and they can be taken apart um, so looking at pieces that can be constantly redesigned but really exploring the fact that actually the glass is sturdy and um, that textile is soft and trying to understand what that relationship is and how we can take advantage of it. So this is another one of those pieces um, that I made for my MA show and what I showed in Collect this year. So that um, very fortunately went to a lovely, lovely person. It was definitely the person for the piece walked into the room and she said, I'm having that. And um, absolutely suited her down to the ground. So that's gone off to her now in London. Um, and it definitely takes a very brave, I think, individual to wear lovely spiky uh, gold and black glass on their arm. But um, she had the confidence to pull it off, which is great. So um, I want to kind of go back a little bit to what I was saying earlier about actually being able to 3D print fixings that fit glass um, that's handmade and handmade kind of within risk. Um, is really turns the whole making process on the head like before I would have been used to making glass and going to the hardware store and finding parts and fixings and fittings for it and really just like working the glass so much grinding it and gluing it to try and make it work with these pre-made parts and what digital design does now it flips it right on its head we can actually make the blown glass part Bring it, bring it up to the 3D, 3D um, digital design studio. We can even scan it in to get the exact, um, get the exact rep, digital replica of what, what the shape is. And we can build um, fixtures and fittings to fit it exactly. So it becomes bespoke to the piece. Um, but what this also means is that because we're able to do that, we're able to adapt to different um, scenarios and different problems that can be thrown at us very easily. What's different is that even though I try to be influenced by modes of mass manufactured production, mass manufactured production uses factory lines and machines that were built to make a specific object. And it's very hard to change that, or it's a lot of investment to change that. However, working on a smaller scale and working with digital design means that it's a kind of decentralized unit and you're able to adapt very easily. So this is a quote by Amelia Klein and it just really sums up exactly everything that my master's research was getting at and it's that dinosaurs are not as nimble as shoals of fish and as neo artisans all of us are we're part of a shoal of fish and now that we're being asked to consider the environmental impact of our practice we're equipped with the tools to be able to move with that and uh, recreate a new practice far easier than a big uh, factory can. So as another quick example, something really small, you wouldn't even see it. These are little um, washers and grommets that I laser cut out of acrylic for my light pieces, which I'll show you here. And what it meant was there was no glue used in this piece at all, which meant that um, each of these parts could be taken apart. So if someone saw this uh, pendant lighting and said, I like that, but do you know what? I've got like a center of a stairwell or I've got a long hallway. It needs to be a different shape. We could always redesign that um, and it become kind of pick, pick and mix modular approach to the design. And all that's enabled 
by using these very, very simple um, washers and grommets that um, I was able to make very quickly by laser cutting some acrylic. So after I finished my MA, I had the absolute um, privilege to go and actually talk about my work in different conferences. Um, the one I did straight after my MA was uh, Making Futures, also based down in Plymouth College of Art, but it was a blind peer reviewed process to get into that. So I'm very lucky to have gotten that. And um, this paper actually that I presented at the conference is going to be published in um, their journal, um, hopefully by the end of the year. So I uh, let you know earlier that I was in Collect this year by the Crafts Council here in Britain in Somerset House. So I wanted to make just one final piece of work. I mean, you know, us makers, we always try to expand to fill the time that we have. We're never relaxed and rested and ready to go into something. We always try and make the most of every single minute. So uh, I tried to rush along and make one more piece. So uh, this piece is actually made out of water jet cut silicone. Um, which the pattern for this actually I created on Rhino again on the CAD program and then I got a water jet cut out of this sheet silicone which is incredibly durable and then I just hand sewed it at home to create a 3D form so you're looking at kind of even um, pattern making and how the 2D can assemble to become the 3D and each of these holes allow the um, glass to pop in and out of it without using glue and it's held, held in place um, and it becomes a very soft um, malleable object but the glass then becomes very very durable and this is the kind of um, kind of stud work design I was talking about earlier that I could use within clothing. So you'll see there uh, that was just one section I was I printed out the uh, design that was getting cut um, at the water jet cutters trying to plan out how many glass pieces I'd, I need, would need. And in the end, there was nearly 600 glass pieces in this piece. Um, it, nearly, it nearly drove me mad, but um, it was 30 hours straight, basically, of glass making. It was un unbelievable. But then uh, the result is this um, object, which is very curious. And the reason why I really wanted to bring it to collect is because I wanted it as a, a true engagement object that people could come and squeeze and manipulate and see that actually glass isn't that fragile and you don't have to be scared of it and actually getting involved with it and really um, loving it and using it is far better than being scared of it breaking and sitting on a shelf gathering dust. So um, Northland's Creative um, are a glass school based in Scotland and uh, they saw my work at the Ireland Glass Biennale last year which I was fortunate to be a part of and there and then they said, we want to bring you to collect, which was unbelievable. I've never had that happen to me before. Where I often had to make a few pages long application to get into something. They just uh, saw my work, uh, saw my presentation at the symposium that was on in conjunction with it and said, yeah, that's what we want. So that was absolutely unbelievable. So they're based up in the very, 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 very north of Scotland, um, an incredibly rural place but it's um, a fully functioning glass um, workshop and they have people in from all over the world to work there on residency. So they really support the glass community. And this was um, installing uh, during Collect. It was a very stressful um, one day to install absolutely everything in that room. And here is us all um, done up at the end, looking a little bit, um, probably uh, a, little, a little bit uh, tired and worn out, but um, it was a really great team we were part of and a really great range of um, other glassmakers. So um, there's people you'll see there, there um, that work for Northlands, um, but there's also other makers there. And even say like on the far left, um, Alberto, he comes from Murano, which is famed for its traditional glassmaking, but he's an architect works as a designer for um, my glassmakers there. So there was a real emphasis on actually redefining what glass means um, by Northland. So it was brilliant to be supported by them for that. So this is my show there. It has, you'll probably recognize all of the pieces in the background. Um, it has that big uh, piece, Bells of Digitalis, which I made for my uh, graduate show in Dublin. It has uh, that, piece that I finished off just the week before it, right beside it, but I actually turned it into a light very last minute. Um, and then it has those arm pieces, the neck piece, and what's just cut out of the image there is that long pendant light as well that I showed you. So it was really important for me to actually show 
the fact that actually glass has multiple applications and a design practice wind glass has multiple, multiple applications and that once you figure out how things can work together and your aesthetic and what's important to you, you don't have to um, decide that you're going to only make, uh, say, home products or you're going to only make jewellery. It's kind of, you really have to figure out what's important about the material practice to you and whatever way that kind of um, appears in a physical form, just go with it. So um, luckily enough, during lockdown, I managed to secure a job, uh, which is almost unheard of, uh, here at the University for the Creative Arts in Surrey. Um, so it's in Farnham, a town called Farnham in Surrey. We're about an hour outside of London, but uh, it's got amazing glass facilities. We've got a glass and ceramics program here and a jewellery program as well um, within a larger campus and um, does all sorts of art courses. And I also, um, the weekend just gone, was I was meant to be in Sweden uh, presenting at the Glass Art Society conference, um, presenting actually a lecture very similar to what I'm giving you today. But um, instead, this all had to go online and become virtual. But it was absolutely phenomenal. All of the presentations are now pre-recorded online. So if you are interested in getting involved in Glass, or you already are involved in glass, please go out, go and check out their uh, YouTube channel and they have all of the pre-recordings there for you to watch at your own leisure. But they're just an absolute amazing resource of all different sorts of uh, glass making techniques. So this was the uh, presentation that I uh, pre-recorded and put up online then for them. Uh, so I'd also like uh, to take the chance now to direct you to my own YouTube channel where if you are interested in getting involved in glass making I'm actually doing a series now which shows you how to make glass at home during lockdown so if you've ever wanted to get involved in it or you're already a glass maker and you feel like you're stuck in a bit of a rush away from your usual tools and equipment and everything that we're used to I've put together um, a series of home glass hacks so it just teaches you how to do different sorts of glass making and there's even things like how to make um, your own kind of tumblers. This is a drinking glass made out of a wine glass and it shows you how to bend glass using a tea light, which is amazing. I didn't even know um, that you could do that until a few weeks before I made that video. Um, how to use UV uh, glue for lamination techniques to make sculptures. Um, there's a, an introduction there to the copper foiling technique, which is a very accessible way to make stained glass at home. And you don't need too many um, tools for that. So please do check it out if you want to get involved in glass. And the demo that I was hoping to show you today, but unfortunately couldn't be, was the glass bending using a tea light. So um, luckily enough, it's actually there on my YouTube. So please do uh, look at that instead. And it's probably better anyways, because it's far more thorough than the rushed few minutes I might give you now anyways. So I want to take the opportunity now as well to actually invite all of you, whether you're a craftsperson or not, whether you have been working with a material or working with glass or not, it really doesn't matter if you've ever wanted to kind of, I guess, get involved in um, lamp working, which is using a flame to manipulate glass. This is a perfect way to do so, but I'm doing a collaborative project where I'm asking people from all around the world to create words by bending a glass uh, rod over a tea light candle or a normal candle um, to create a word that's reflective of their time in isolation. So this project um, will combine these words from all of you guys and makers from around the world and I'll install them as a mass um, artwork installation. And what I'm going to do is then light that installation and illuminate the glass words. But what's going to be more important is the shadows that they cast. So this is really a reflection on all of the uh, video calling, the WhatsApping, Facebook messages, Instagram, everything that you've been doing to your friends and family to stay connected. They're the words that I want you to um, write out and give them the respect that they actually deserve. These words that over social media, we would have maybe not given them the respect that they deserve before now have actually held our community together internationally during this time. So, you know, it's really quite wonderful these words we're sharing, even if it's as simple as how are you? 
Um, they're just so important and I want to be able to show that off, but I'd love for you guys to get involved. And again, there is um, nothing too technical in this. It's just enthusiasm to give it a go. So I'm going to show you where to access that on my website. If you bear with me, I'm going to exit out of this presentation very briefly and just show you on my website where to get all the information for that. So that's great, Laura. Thanks, especially. Um, I can't believe we're, we're nearly up on an hour. Oh dear, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make it brief then. <laughs> no, well, um, I think a lot of people would love to see more, so go ahead. Okay, absolutely. Well, give, give, me, give me the word if, uh, if we go over. So um, this is it here on my website. Um, so it's lauraquindesign.com. Um, on the main page in my website, uh, you'll see some images there, a little bit about me probably need to update it. I really should be using lockdown to uh, flesh out my website a bit more. We probably all should. Um, and if you go in here into open call, it uh, gives you the whole details about the project, um, what it is and how to get involved. So we, it's a step-by-step -step guide of how to get involved. Step one is saying yes, just get involved. Um, and then go to my YouTube channel to watch the demos. Um, I also have them linked at the bottom of this page. I have here on step four where to buy these glass rods. They're called stringers because they're very thin. Um, and this, these two sites that I've mentioned here actually are UK based, so they can ship to UK and Ireland um, if you're based, based over this side. Um, and uh, just down here, you'll see two videos on how to make those glass words using a tea light. So it's very handy. And if you have any questions at all, just submit that um, form to me um, online and I'll get back to you at some point. Um, I also must note that uh, these glass words, I will ask you to post them to me. I often put up my address here publicly, but if you are getting involved, just email me and say, I want to get involved and then I'll send you the um, address to post them to. And we're really hoping to get this um, project, which you could be involved in, to be displayed on an international um, seen on an international um, exhibition so we're just in the process of actually working that out but the it could potentially maybe be shown stateside next year so fingers crossed we won't say too much more about that but please do get involved the more the merrier so i'll just quickly go back and um finish off this presentation with some concluding thoughts so really what I want to get at here is that the traditional and the digital, they're not opposing. We can really work them together to create a more sustainable and beautiful practice. And, uh, you know, the answer really to environmental, uh, environmentally friendly design isn't to uh, kind of forget about consumption, um, because that's always going to happen. You know, like even back to when we first were bartering, um, production and consumption, it just, it happens. It's part of our nature and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but as neo-artisans, how can we redesign how it happens that it, that it becomes more sustainable? And I, you know, I really have to say that not using glass because it's too precious is a waste. I say there's nothing um, more of a pity than granny's dresser full of uh, old crystal gathering dust. It's just such a pity. You know, if like glass takes a lot of, um, of fossil fuels to make. So if we're going to have glass and we're going to use it and love it, and that somehow kind of negates um, the amount of energy that was put in to actually make it. And uh, if you have a piece of glass that took a few minutes to make and a few minutes of gas burning, if that lasts lifetimes, then the overall impact of the piece is actually quite low. Um, so really we have to look at building up the connection with the glass object, but not even just the glass object. If you makers out there, if you're, you know, ceramics or textiles or metals, that you build up that connection with the user. Um, and that's actually what's going to make it have a longer life. Um, you know, of course it, it comes down to looking at the design and um, how well it's made, of course. But, um, you know, you can, you can really put some of that responsibility in the user's hands and it's something that they're going to want to look after and care for for lifetimes if they really build up that connection from an early stage with the piece. And um, I'd like to then kind of put this brave statement out here and say that actually materiality and loving materials is an antidote for materialism and all of the negative effects of materialism that we're having right now during the, this kind of environmental crisis, but actually loving materials and not just liking flashy material goods uh, they're two very different things and loving materials um, 
in itself could be an antidote. Communication with the audience is key, as I said, and um, we really need an audience that supports handicraft, but that's also going to support its new relationship with small industry and digital manufacturing. Um, we have to really kind of convey to our audience that yes, we are kind of keeping tradition alive and we're keeping heritage alive, but our audience has to be able to come on that journey with us and not um, judge, I guess, uh, our work to be any less authentic because it takes on new uh, technologies and, and digital manufacturing. So we really have to be able to communicate that with our audience and bring them on that journey with us. And uh, finally, glass is flexible, it's durable and it's wearable. So really trying to push what we think of glass. So thank you very much. Uh, stay safe, of course, during this time and stay glassy always. Um, and I have my details up here for my website. Um, my email address is there as well, but you can also contact me through my website. I have my Facebook there and my Instagram. So it's all basically comes under Laura Quinn Design. So for my website, um, my Facebook and my Instagram, but also up on my YouTube channel, um, just Google Laura Quinn Design and subscribe to my channel there. And I'll be adding uh, videos, uh, perhaps maybe every week, every two weeks, hopefully um, for the foreseeable to keep us making during lockdown. So that's it, but I think we now hopefully we'll have enough time to take some questions. We do, don't worry Laura, we have plenty of time. Uh, but thank you very much for that. Um, when you were just chatting about your videos, it's really lovely. We have one comment from Grace who says that she has watched all of your YouTube videos um, and that for someone so accomplished, you make the practice seem very accessible to anyone and everyone. And what oh, bad. Which is a lovely comment to get uh, right yeah. off the bat. Um, and one other comment we have is, uh, Patricia wants to know, would it be possible to share your project with friends, family and the community uh, for everyone to get involved? Oh yeah, please do. Please do. Anybody that you think um, need, needs to get their hands busy during lockdown, share it with anybody. I really, the more the merrier. I think um, this project is going to rely on community pulling together. So as many people as you think get involved, it's a great activity to do as well to keep you busy a little bit past the evening. So please do share away. Great. Um, another one, more of a technical one. Um, mm. Ashton was just wondering, what temperature do you bring your tumblers to for the fire polish? Oh, so I don't actually fire polish them. Um, so when I blow my tumblers, um, they go into the kneeler and they come down to room temperature. And then the next day I cut them on a saw and then I grind them and um, bevel the edges as well. And then bring them up to a polish using um, either a cork belt or a cork wheel with pumice. So you can fire polish um, objects, absolutely. Um, it's actually not something I've tried yet, but it's on the list to do as soon as we get back into the workshops. Um, but the reason I guess I didn't include it in the design for that is because I was basing the design for these tumblers on a, a business um, plan that I would, would be able to maybe blow for one or two days a month and then spend the next few days grinding and um, polishing these pieces. So um, I'll certainly put up a post about it when I get round to it on um, my Instagram. So keep an eye out for that. And thanks very much for that question. Great. Uh, another one we have is, did you exhibit in the recent Irish Glass Biennale in the Coach House? Yeah, I did. It was unbelievable. I don't know how many of you got to visit it, but it was just such a brilliant, brilliant array work. And that all goes down as well to Dr. Caroline Madden for putting that together. It's such a huge amount of work. And she's managed, managed to gather people in from all around the world to do that. So I did. I actually showed the white neck piece and... Um, the clear arm piece that was mixed with the rubber that I also showed at Collect. So if you check that out, hopefully um, you might have seen it and hopefully I'll be in it again when when the when it comes up when it comes around again. Yeah, fantastic opportunity to be involved. And then actually speaking of opportunities, someone was wondering, um, how do you find out about all of the internship opportunities, for example, in Estonia and in Corning? So they're just wondering yeah. Uh, so this is um, definitely advice for anyone in any profession. All you have to do is ask. I often say to my students, I put up a slide with um, Don't Ask, Don't Get from, uh, from Keith Lemon. 
Um, so you really just have to ask. So basically, I just um, found out who the person was to contact in Corning, sent an email to them saying, hey, can you take me for a summer? And they did. And then um, I knew that I wanted to go to Estonia for my Erasmus internship. Uh, so I literally just Googled glass blowing in Estonia. I found an artist and she said, well, I actually don't have a studio, but I work out of this studio, which is the one that I then ended up uh, spending time in. So it's not that these were listed anywhere as adverts or opportunities. Sometimes you just have to push yourself out there and don't be afraid to ask. I mean, the worst that they can tell you is no, you just have to be really polite in the way you go about it. And it's always worthwhile throwing in a compliment or two saying, I love your work. Will you take me on for the summer? So uh, definitely check that out. But if you um, are based in England or Ireland and are working in glass or want to work in glass, I would contact a guy called Alan J. Poole. Um, I need to, I, I perhaps should have put that up inside what his email address is. Bear with me one moment. I'll look at his email address because um, he compiles a newsletter letter that goes out to um, anybody who signs up to it that basically shows all job opportunities, exhibition opportunities, um, tools for sale, anything like that. Um, and he welcomes anybody who wants to sign up for the newsletter. So it's Alan J. Poole. So that's A-L-A-N-J-P-O-O-L-E. So that's, um, there's no full stops or anything. Alan J. Poole at AOL.com. So hopefully you've all taken that down. So just email him and say, um, hi, I'd like to sign up for your newsletter. And he literally posts every opportunity in there that he knows of, um, not just for jobs, but for exhibitions, anything like that. And that's actually where I found out about um, the job I got in Local Glass in the Cotswolds. And it's also where I found out about the job that I'm in now. So he's um, definitely um, a brilliant, brilliant person to be in contact with. Great, Laura. Um, thanks for that. And Aoife has just put in as well, the Glass Society of Ireland also lists opportunities. Yes. So, Oh, of course. I'm so sorry. Of course. To do. <laughs> no, she's saying like, that's great. It's, it's, um, she's going to, yeah. I think, for everyone to, to take note of. Yeah. No, I'm sure there's lots of different places, so it's great to hear. Oh, and thanks. And Aoife has put in um, the website, which is glasssocietyofireland.com. So I'll, I'll put that back into the um, chat as well, just in case. Absolutely. And, and the Glass Society are an amazing network. And what's really great about them is, um, you know, it's not even like you have to be performing glass, glass maker in Ireland to be part of it. You absolutely don't. Um, if you have any sort of enthusiasm towards glass, whether that's as a maker or just an admirer, and you have a connection kind of to Ireland, you don't even have to be based in Ireland. But I guess some sort of enthusiasm towards Irish glass um they're a brilliant community to be part of and they send out um newsletters as well just just kind of in a similar way that Alan does with um opportunities but they also do a great um kind of selection of news um and I guess success stories as well from the field so um they also have um an Instagram account as well and a Facebook account so they're really uh, great to keep an eye on because they do post up quite regularly about different things that are happening within the field. Great, we're getting some really nice comments and um, just a lot of thank yous and thank you for being so generous with your with your time and with your techniques and for sharing it. And um, a lot of people just saying how inspirational it is to see the work. And um, again, some really nice comments. And it's true, it's nice that, I mean, you can see what, what it is there that you can aspire to, but also then you've got those lovely demo videos that everyone can just try and do from home or, you know, can watch. And yeah, it's really lovely overview of glass. Um, oh, thank you. Someone else is putting in more of the uh, Glass Society websites and thanks everyone else. So any other links there, please do keep sharing them into the chat. If anyone else has any other questions, please put them in again. I think thanks everyone just... as well. Uh, for for shooting off those questions so far it's really really good to get any feedback it's kind of I'm used to giving these um talks in a live scenario where there is um an audience there that I can see and of course I can't see all your lovely faces today so it's really great for you to be using this opportunity to just shoot off questions and really really engage with it yeah and I think 
I think we'll probably finish up shortly because yeah, we're getting some really lovely comments um, and thank yous, but I don't think anyone has any other specific questions. No I did share a link in there and it is just for Design and Crafts Council of Ireland's website. So it's dcci.ie forward slash get Ireland making and you can see other workshops that we have uh, coming up over the next few weeks and months and we are delighted that we're going to have Laura back again with us we have to nail down a date but it will be in hopefully June July or August so uh, we'll keep everyone posted on that and it'd be great to have Laura back and and hopefully maybe this time Laura we can uh, do some glass demo or oh, I hope so <laughs> You might not lock yourself out that day. Okay. Oh, I might. Not. Well, I mean, I could go one better and just fingers crossed next time um, I'm back with you. I mean, we're hoping here we might be back in the actual studio, but we're just going to have to wait and see, unfortunately. But uh, first things first is I need to get back into the, <laughs> to the garage and get those keys out. <laughs> no problem. And a lot of people are asking... Um, who they can follow up with for getting the presentations. So Laura has already shared some of the videos with myself. So I'm going to put in here the um, Get Ireland Making at dcci.ie email. Um, for anyone that wants to get in touch directly, I can forward it on to you as well. And then I can obviously send you on any links that Laura gives me to her website and to her social media too. Yeah, and it's worth noting as well don't you send out a newsletter or something every so often with opportunities as well we do so design and crafts council obviously has um list their opportunities as well on the website we have a newsletter that you can sign up to and we have our guilds and networks and societies and um, so obviously glass work and design would come under that so yeah. if anyone's in, interested in finding any out any more please do just sign up to the design and crafts council newsletter and that's on the website Fab. No, I just don't, yeah, just I think um, everyone's just saying how inspirational it is. And thank you again, Laura, for taking the time. Oh, well, thank you, everyone, for sticking sticking through it. And I'm sorry I didn't have a live demo for you, but uh, really thank you for having the patience to stay with me and getting involved. But um, do, you know, reach out to me online on um, my social media or on, through my website or email. Um, you know, I really love to kind of get audience feedback or to hear what you're getting up to yourself. So um, always feel free to send me a message on there. Great. And once again, we have recorded this, so it will be on DCCI's YouTube channel um, if anyone else wants to check it out. But I think we'll finish there. I just want to say a huge thank you again to Laura. Um, it was really, I mean, I was commenting on this earlier on, but the images and the, the quality of them are just fantastic to see. And I think everyone agrees that it's, it's beautiful to see some of the work and how it's being made. Um, so thank you for taking the time and sharing it with us today. Absolutely, my pleasure. And thanks a million, Shauna, as well, for organising all of this. And uh, we've been, what you haven't seen behind the scenes is we've, we've been actually uh, chatting for weeks and weeks trying to organise this for you guys. So um, a thousand thanks to you for that as well. Thanks, Laura. I love uh, some of the comments already. Ordering the glass rods straight away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, any be getting a lot of post. at all. Huh? You'll be getting a lot of post. I know I had to ring up the company and say, look, you might get um, a peek in your orders for clear glass stringers. So <laughs> um, to explain to them why that might happen, that's not just a phenomenon. But um, when you do get them in the post, bear in mind, it takes a little bit longer to get to Ireland during uh, lockdown because I know some people have ordered them, but they did kind of get them in about like two weeks or so. So just be patient. There's no specific uh, closing date for this open call. It's really just about... Um, if, you know, being reflective of your time during lockdown and in isolation. Uh, but, you know, the sooner the better, obviously. Um, but if you've any questions while you are getting involved in that project or if you're set up at home with your tea light and you just don't know how to go about it, give me a message and I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. Great, Laura. Listen, thanks again to you and to everyone else for joining us today. Uh, we hope everyone can get back out now and enjoy the sun. We're having a lovely time for it in Ireland. I'm sure it's the same for you over in Farnham, Laura. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Well, everyone, stay safe and thanks again for joining. Thanks a million. Bye bye. Bye bye.